Great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, so today I'd like to talk about uh, how to think about laws of nature in the light of modern physics. Um, and basically what I want to argue is that a number of traditional ways of thinking about laws of nature aren't a good fit for the reality of modern physics and the wide variety of types of laws that we are encountering in modern physics. Um, and this is particularly a problem for accounts of lawhood, which I want to say that laws govern or make things happen. So those accounts of lawhood in particular are really in need of updating so that they can properly accommodate the wide range of possible laws that we are now dealing with in modern physics. Uh, so I'm going to begin by giving some motivation uh, in terms of discussing some varieties of, of types of laws uh, in modern physics that go beyond the time evolution paradigm and thus aren't well accommodated by traditional accounts of lawhood. Uh, I'll then look at a few different accounts of lawhood and assess the degree to which they succeed in accommodating these types of non-standard laws. Uh, this will motivate uh, my new proposal, which uh, basically conceptualizes law, laws as a form of constraints, and I'll give some examples of how that works. Um, now, the point of this project is not just to answer the question of what is a law of nature, but also I, hopefully to provide a framework which will be useful uh, when we are, are trying to address questions in physics and philosophy related to the nature of lawhood. Um, so after giving the proposal, I'll give some example applications uh, in terms of uh, application to determinism and objective chance. So there's a kind of long-standing way of thinking about physics uh, where we imagine the universe as something like a computer which takes in an initial state and evolves it forward in time. Uh, and that I'll call it the time evolution paradigm. Uh, and that way of thinking, I think, is still quite dominant, but it is beginning to be challenged. Uh, and we're seeing the appearance in modern physics of a variety of types of laws, which really don't look like a very good fit for that kind of picture anymore. Uh, indeed, non-time evolution laws have been around for a long time, uh, even Newtonian mechanics, in addition to its sort of standard time evolution Hamiltonian formulation, can also be written in a Lagrangian form, where rather than taking a state and evolving it forwards in time, we instead optimize a quantity known as the Lagrangian, uh, and the idea is that the system will take the trajectory which optimizes its Lagrangian. So traditionally, people have tended to think about the Hamiltonian formulation as in some sense representing the real structure of, of the world. And the Lagrangian formulation has been regarded as merely a convenient calculational tool. Uh, but the two formulations are equivalent. So uh, this doesn't necessarily seem to be in any good scientific reason for that preference. Uh, it mostly seems to be based on some sort of vague back, background met metaphysics about uh, the flow of time or the direction of time and so on. Uh, so one might ask, should we perhaps take the Lagrangian formulation more seriously? Uh, and indeed, in modern physics, particularly in quantum mechanics, Lagrangian formulations have become much more widely used and do seem to be a really important part of the theory, which has prompted calls from various people back to think that perhaps we should be taking the Lagrangian formulation seriously uh, as equal to or perhaps even more fundamental than the time evolution formulation. Uh, we're sort of seeing similar effects in relativity as well. Uh, special relativity already poses some challenges to the time evolution picture because particularly if you have a non-local theory, uh, in order to have time evolution, you need to select preferred foliation of space-time on which that evolution can take, take place. Uh, and preferred foliations are not very uh, much at home with relativity's denial of the existence of absolute simultaneity. Uh, that particular picture becomes even clearer in general relativity uh, because the Einstein equations in their usual form are not time evolution equations. Their solution is not a state at a time, but rather an entire history of the universe. So the Einstein equations in some sense seem to be determining the whole history all at once, rather than starting at some point and evolving towards the end. Uh, now, the Einstein equations can be given a time evolution formulation, but in order to make that work, we have to place quite severe constraints on the initial state to make sure that the resulting evolution is allowed. Uh, and furthermore, the time evolution formulation isn't available for all types of space times, particularly not space times, particularly space times which are not globally hyperbolic. So it, it seems quite reasonable to think that the non time evolution formulation of the Einstein equations is in some sense more natural or more fundamental, and that provides evidence for the, the the view that general relativity should not be thought of as a time evolution theory. Uh, similarly, because quantum gravity uh, is intended as a, as a quantum version of general relativity, a number of approaches to quantum gravity also seem also look as though they're not really time evolution theories. Uh, so in particular, covariant loop quantum gravity and causal set theory look as if they're not, not they shouldn't really be thought of as time evolution approaches. 
uh, so everything I've just mentioned is relatively mainstream physics. There are also a variety of, 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 of more speculative ideas approaching, which similarly move away from the time evolution paradigm. Uh, so for example, we have recently renewed interest in retrocausal approaches to quantum foundations uh, in, in the work of, for example, Wharton, Price and Sutherland, who are particularly interested in using retrocausality uh, to give an explanation of, of non-locality. Um, Similarly, in quantum information and foundations, we're seeing interest in expressing quantum mechanics in terms of very general principles like the no signaling principle, which says that, uh, that superluminal uh, signaling is impossible. Now, the no signaling principle seems to me like a quite a deep and fundamental principle. Uh, it seems like the kind of thing which certainly is a good candidate for a fundamental law of nature, but it is certainly not a time evolution law, and it can't straightforwardly be written in the form of a time evolution law. Uh, elsewhere, we also, also see, particularly in the study of closed time-like curves, the need to impose consistency conditions uh, in order to avoid contradictions. Again, the need to avoid contradictions seems like a very deep and fundamental principle, uh, but it is, again, uh, not a time evolution, e evolution principle, and these consistency conditions can't very easily be expressed in anything that looks like a time evolution law. And finally, we're seeing increasing the importance of constraints in physics. So, for example, in canonical quantization, an important step is imposing the Hamiltonian constraint, which requires that the Hamiltonian of the whole universe should vanish. Um, so again, uh, that, that constraint doesn't look anything like a time evolution law. Uh, indeed, it applies to the whole of history all at once. There's no, really no way one could imagine that being conceptualized as a time, evo time ev evolution law. Um, so in the, similarly in that direction, Deutsch and Maletto have an interesting approach uh, where they're attempting to formulate all the laws of physics as constructor laws. And those constructor laws are, are basically constraints which say that certain types of processes are possible or impossible. So again, uh, that, that's another approach to lawhood, which looks like it can't be fitted into the time evolution approach. So we are seeing a wide variety of laws uh, in physics, which look like they don't fit very well with this, with this naive picture of the universe as a computer that takes a state and evolves at forward in time. Um, and it's not necessarily my intention to, to claim that all of the laws on the slide are definitely correct fundamental laws of physics, uh, but all of the laws on the slide are taken seriously by at least some phys physicists. Uh, and my contention is simply that philosophy of science should be able to recognize these types of things as at least possible laws um, that you know, if the physicists take them seriously, then the philosophers should also take them seriously. And therefore, we need to have an account of lawhood, which is able to allow that things like these could potentially be laws. So how do existing approaches to lawhood fare on that point? Um, one uh, popular approach to uh, analyzing laws uh, is to see them as relations between universals. This approach was developed in particular by Armstrong, Fritzke, and Thule, and it tells us that uh, laws must be written in the form of relations between universals, which are usually conceptualized as perfectly natural properties. Uh, so, for example, Newton's uh, law F equals MA is conceptualized as a relation between the universals of force and acceleration, or similar. So uh, the problem with this type, this formulation uh, in the context of non-time evolution laws is that it has a very strongly reductionist flavor. So perfectly natural properties uh, are often, often regarded as being those which slice at nature at the joints. And that phrasing is often taken very literally. Uh, the perfectly natural properties tend to be ascribed to the very smallest constituents of, constituents of reality, whatever those may, might be. So things like the masses and charges of fundamental particles are often put forward as possible uh, universal or perfectly natural properties. Um, and that makes uh, this formulation quite a poor fit for many of the non-time evolution, non evolution laws we saw on the previous slide, because many of those laws deal with things which are not very local at all, and thus don't look a lot like perfectly natural properties. Um, a Lagrangian, for example, is quite hard to associate with any specific, specific constituent or local region. It seems to be a property of an entire history and often of several different particles at once. Uh, so it, it seems hard to put a Lagrangian law in, in the formulation of a relation between universals. In addition, uh, these perfectly natural, natural properties are also often understood as kinematical features, uh, which means they rely on a, on a well-defined distinction between kinematical parts of the theory and dynamical parts of the theory, whereby kinematics, I mean something like the state of possible states, uh, the space of possible states, uh, and by dynamics, I mean something like the state of possible evolutions. Uh, so 
in, in this kind of picture, the, the universes themselves belong to the kinematics and, and the relations between them are supposed to induce various possible dynamical changes. Um, but that distinction between kinematic and dynamics uh, isn't going to work very well in the context of a non-time evolution formulation, because uh, in that kind of picture, we don't have uh, we don't really have time evolution for dynamics in the usual way. There are uh, generalizations of the kinematical dynamical distinction, which are better, better suited for the non-time evolution picture. Um, but the universals uh, analysis really seems to rely, rely on the more naive distinction between states and evolutions. Uh, and thus, there seems to be a, a, a problem if we want to uh, apply this kind, of, this kind of analysis in the context of non-time evolution laws. Furthermore, in addition to all the types of laws I mentioned on the previous slide, it's also been pointed out by various people that the universal's account also has problems with, with conservation laws, functional laws, laws concerning irreversibly defined properties, and laws about the re retention of dispositions. Uh, so there's a very wide range of laws within modern physics which just seem totally impossible to analyze as relations between universals. Uh, now, one might try to respond to this by making the notion of universal more general to allow that universals could perhaps be non-local or uh, might be non-kinematical features. Um, but I, I worry that this would inevitably take us too far from what anyone would naturally understand as a universal. Uh, in particular, many of the laws on the previous slide uh, involve features of reality which exhibit multiple realizability. So, for example, if one wanted to write the no signaling principle as a relation between universals, one would presumably have to have to see signaling as a universal. Uh, but signaling can be implemented in many different ways, you know, by sending a letter, by a telephone call, by a carrier pigeon. Uh, so, and it doesn't necessarily seem any reasonable way to say that all of those very different processes have a single perfectly natural property in common. So I'm not very optimistic that a general generalization of the universal's account could ever uh, accommodate all the types of laws we saw, uh, we see us seeing appearing in modern physics. Another popular approach of lawhood is the powers account, which was developed in particular by Cartwright, Bird, and Ellis, uh, which where we're supposed to think that powers are real, irreducible, and causally responsible for the ways in which things turn out. So when entities interact, their individual powers determine the outcome of that interaction. Uh, so the problems here are pretty similar to the ones that uh, we saw in the universal's account, because powers, like perfectly natural properties, are very naturally thought of as local. Powers are typically ascribed to individual objects, and those objects have specific locations, um, which makes it quite difficult to, uh, to express in, uh, laws which are non-time evolution and non-local in this formulation. Uh, so, for example, it seems quite difficult to, to express a Lagrangian law uh, as a power of anything. What would that be a power of and at what time would the power be executed? Uh, similarly, because powers, uh, the, the idea of powers is basically an anthropomorphic metaphor, the notion of powers uh, relies on our own experience of performing actions at times and seeing results uh, results follow from them, and therefore the powers uh, account also relies on a clear separation between the kinematics and dynamics, which again makes it hard to accommodate many non-time evolution laws. Um, so as in the previous case, one might hope to solve these problems by generalizing the account. So for example, uh, there have been proposals that one might ascribe powers to the world as a whole rather than to individual entities. Um, but I'm not sure that this is going to succeed because once one does that, it seems that, that we're getting that it's unclear that these things are powers in any meaningful sense. Uh, the force of the powers metaphor seems to lose it, seems to be lost uh, once we start ascribing powers to the whole world because it's unclear at that point that we're doing anything other than just stating laws. Uh, so it's unclear what we gained by invoking this powers metaphor in the first place. So again, I'm not convinced that the powers account can really be generalized sufficiently to accommodate the large range of laws we see in modern physics. Uh, in another direction, we have Humean accounts of laws of nature, which roughly speaking say that laws do, do not govern or make things happen. They're just a succinct description of everything that does in fact happen. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, uh, Perhaps the most well-known version of this is Lewis's best systems view, which says that the laws of nature are simply the axioms of the best axiomatization of the Humean mosaic, where the term Humean mosaic here refers to uh, the set of all actual physical non-modal things uh, existing within a possible world. So the Humean approach actually does quite well with many of the examples we've previously discussed, uh, because Lewis doesn't tell us very much about, you know, what counts what counts as a valid axiomatization. One can imagine uh, types of axiomatizations which might have many of the laws we've, we've just looked at as axioms. Um, 
I do think that there's likely to be problems with laws that concern possibility and impossibility, like the constructor approach, because uh, in this picture, uh, laws are derived from activitizing the actual Fumian mosaic, and so we don't really have the option to say anything else about other possible mosaics. So in particular, it seems hard to express in this framework um, the, a situation where some particular process does not occur in the actual world, but nonetheless, that process is possible. Uh, but that said, the human approach does seem to be doing much better than uh, the powers and the universal's approach in terms of flexibility and accommodating different types of laws. And, and indeed, I think this is probably a big part of its appeal to philosophers, particularly philosophers of physics. I think there's an awareness that the human approach is much more flexible and, and accommodates uh, the, the variety of laws we see in modern physics much better. Um, but the human approach has its disadvantages. Uh, because precisely because it doesn't allow us to say that laws govern and people, various people have worried that this means uh, that we lose the power to use, use laws as explanation or we lose the grounding for making extrapolations from the observed to the unobserved. Um, I don't really want to get into the dispute between governance and non-governance approaches of law here, uh, but, but the point I do want to make is that I see no reason why only human approaches uh, could have this kind of flexibility. Uh, there's no reason in principle why a governance approach could, could not also be uh, flexible uh, and could not also have that same kind of ability to, to accommodate the, the range of laws we see in modern physics. Uh, so uh, my opinion is that th in this particular aspect, the advantage that human approaches appear to have over governance approaches is illusory and is just a consequence of the fact that we don't currently have a very good governance approach which is able to accommodate the, the variety of laws we see in modern physics. So one of the main, main uh, ideas in this project uh, is to provide a governance approach of lawhood which does have the right kind of flexibility so that we can make a fairer comparison between human approaches and governance approaches. Uh, we should also mention primitivist approaches, uh, which say that lawhood is simply a primitive notion and we shouldn't try to analyze it. Um, this is advocated in particular by Maudlin, Carroll, and Longy. Uh, because these, uh, these primitivist approach, approaches require us to essentially provide a stipulated definition of what we take as a law of nature, uh, they do tend to be based quite strongly on what ideas people happen to have about laws of nature at the time, and that thus there's a danger that they, that they build in whatever dogmas uh, people are currently believe. So, for example, Maudlin, Maudlin's primitivist approach says that the laws of nature are all fundamental laws of time evolution, uh, thus excluding by fiat all the kinds of laws we discussed earlier. Uh, so I don't, for, for that reason, I think that existing primitive accounts mostly aren't adequate to solve the problem we're addressing here. Uh, that said, there's no reason in principle why a primitive account couldn't work here if a, a, a more a general definition of lawhood were given. Uh, and, and indeed, um, at about the same time as my paper came out, another paper by uh, Eddie Chen and Sheldon Goldstein also came out giving a fairly similar account, but conceptualizing it as a form of primitivism. Uh, so although that's not the root I pursue here, I do think that primitivism could possibly work. Uh, but the route I'm going to go down is to think about laws uh, as a form of, of modal structure. Uh, so this view is, of course, particularly associated with structural realism, uh, but you don't have to be a diehard structural realist to believe it. You're perfectly entitled to think that the world is populated by perfectly ordinary physical objects, but the laws which govern the behavior of those physical objects are a form of modal structure. Uh, now, the arguments for this approach to lawhood look fairly similar to some traditional accounts, uh, traditional arguments for structural realism. Uh, so, for example, one might, one might argue that we have access to laws only via their effects on the physical world. We don't have epistemic access to them in and of themselves, and therefore we shouldn't be epistemically committed to metaphysical claims about what they really are. We should just be metaphysically committed to claims about the modal structures that, that they induce and which mediate their effects on physical reality. Uh, so that would be an argument to, to, towards something akin to traditional epistemic structural realism. Uh, one could also go a step further and argue that laws really are nothing above and beyond modal structure uh, in the tradition of ontic structural realism. Uh, I'm actually going to be agnostic between those two views in, the, in, the talk, in this talk. Uh, the point I want to emphasize is that if one does think that laws govern and laws make things happen, then one seems to be inevitably committed to the idea that laws are at least linked to some kind of modal structure, and therefore uh, using modal structure as a way of understanding and getting a grasp on laws seems like a good way of proceeding. Uh, so, so that is basically the reasoning for, for this, this approach to lawhood. Um, 
That said, existing approaches to understanding laws as modal structure are very focused on understanding them in terms of causal structure. Uh, and causal structure is not a good way of thinking about uh, non-dynamical laws, non-time evolution laws, because this idea of causation is very closely tied into the time evolution picture. Causes are, are usually regarded as being asymmetric and as pointing in the same direction as the time evolution. And thus, for example, it's quite hard to see how one could describe the optimization of a Lagrangian as being a form of causal structure. Um, so although I think the modal structural approach is, is a good way of thinking about laws, uh, in order to make it work in the context of modern physics, we're going to need a much more general way of talking about modal structures, which allows us to, to accommodate all the uh, types of laws outside the time evolution approach that we've been discussing. So that is basically the project. Uh, of this, the, the, the aim of this project to set out a, a much more general framework for modal structure, which allows us to understand the modal structure associated with a, a large variety of possible laws uh, so that we can understand them within the governance paradigm as imposing modal structure. Uh, and the way in which I suggest doing that is by uh, conceptualizing laws as, as, as constraints. Uh, now, this approach is, of course, inspired by the increasing importance of constraints in physics, which we uh, discussed earlier. Um, in addition, constraints seem like a very suitable object to use for this purpose. For a start, they are clearly modal in the sense that uh, they define what is and is not possible or is, is or is not allowed to happen. Uh, furthermore, constraints are not required to be local and are not required to be kinematical. So we saw earlier for, that the Hamiltonian constraint requiring the Hamiltonian of the whole universe is clearly neither local nor kinematical in the standard sense. So the idea of constraints is suitably general and allows us to capture a wide variety of different possible laws. Uh, now, in accordance with the structural approach I just advocated, I am not going to attempt to give a uh, account of the deep metaphysical nature of constraints. Rather, I'm going to define constraints extensionally. So a constraint will be under understood uh, as corresponding to the set of all Humean mosaics in which that constraint is satisfied. So for example, um, that if we write the no signaling principle as a constraint, it would become the constraint uh, consisting of all Humean mosaics in which there is no superluminal signaling. Uh, and the idea here is that if a constraint applies to, the, to a, a particular possible world, that means that the Humean mosaic of that possible world must belong to the set associated with that constraint. Uh, that means that if all of the mosaics in the set associated with some constraint have some property, such as not containing any superluminal signaling, uh, it follows that every, uh, every possible world to which that constraint applies uh, is a possible world whose Humean mosaic has that property. Um, and that just sounds quite familiar. familiar. It's basically just the definition of metaphysical necessitation, uh, where we say that A metaphysically necessitates B, uh, if and only if every possible world which has feature A is also a possible world that has feature B. Uh, so what that means is that uh, we can now say that constraints govern in virtue of metaphysically necessitating that the actual mosaic have, must have certain features. Uh, so that allows us to see this governance relation, which might otherwise seem as a bit mysterious as just a form of modal structure. Um, and, and therefore it is no more or less mysterious than other kinds of modal relations that we are more familiar with. Um, so I should note before I go on that, uh, because people always ask about this, that although I'm using the term Humean mosaic, I am not using it because I am a Humean. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, the aim here is to develop a non-Humean approach to objective modality, uh, and the term Humean mosaic is just being used because it's a really convenient piece of terminology to uh, incorporate the idea of all the actual non-modal contents of some possible world. Uh, so no more than that should be read into it. <laughs> So what exactly is the relation between laws and constraints? Um, it might, might be tempting to say that laws just are constraints and in simple cases like the no signaling principle, this might work. Uh, but the issue, with, issue there is that uh, laws uh, is that this is that laws as constraints don't allow for any kind of indeterminism. So a constraint simply says that the Humean mosaic must belong to a to some particular set. No probability no probability distribution is assigned over that set. So there seems to be no space to have indeterministic laws on that analysis. Um, I think we should allow for indeterminism. So in order to be more general, uh, I will define a law as a probability distribution of the constraints. Um, in simple cases, that distribution might be trivial and the law will just assign probability one to a single constraint. In that kind of case, we can simply identify laws with a law with a constraint. But in more complex cases where we have indeterministic laws, the distribution might be non-trivial. 
Uh, this allows us to think, think of the action of laws in, in basically two steps. Uh, first of all, for every law, we select one constraint according to the associated probability distribution. And then the Bohemian mosaic of the actual world is required to lie in the intersection of all of those constraints. Uh, so again, we have a sense that laws that laws govern by first uh, inducing constraints, and then those constraints metaphysically necessitate that the world should have certain properties. Uh, now, one might ask at this point, uh, given that we have probability distributions anyway, uh, why do we need to have distributions over, over constraints rather than just thinking about laws as probability distributions over mosaics? Uh, so the reason for that is because we should accommodate the fact that many laws may require that the world has certain properties, but may not assign any probabilities over the, the, over the, the possible histories which have that particular property. So the no signaling principle, for example, if it is a law, uh, presumably should be thought of as requiring that the human mosaic of the actual world uh, does not exhibit superluminal signaling, but there's no reason to think that the no signaling principle assigns a probability distribution over mosaics, not even the uniform distribution. Uh, it just tells us that it must belong to this particular set. It doesn't say anything about how to select one mosaic from that set. And the use of constraints is intended to respect that fact and allow uh, us to have non-probabilistic laws like that. And as we'll shortly see, that feature is quite important if one wants to make sense of determinism within this framework. Okay, so some nice features of this analysis. Uh, the first is that uh, it allows us to, to, to express quite a wide range of possible laws um, because in principle, any possible collection of mosaics that one could imagine can be a constraint. Uh, and therefore we can express not only every, every law that one could, could write down in, in uh, closed form in English or maths, but also a wide variety of laws that wouldn't have any simple formulation in English or in, in mathematical language. Uh, so in that sense, this I seems to me that this approach is at least as is at least as flexible as humanism, uh, and thus it kind of fulfills the criterion of showing that governance approaches can be as flexible as humanism and can accommodate the same, uh, the same range of possible laws. Uh, in addition, this approach is a first step towards understanding what kind of paradigm we should be moving to if we are going to move away from the time evolution paradigm. So in, uh, in the picture associated with the constraint framework, rather than thinking of the universe as taking a state and generating the rest of the universe from that state, um, Instead, we can think of the universe as selecting the whole of history all at once. Uh, and this all at once vision of lawhood has been floating around in the literature in various places for a while, but hasn't really been made formal in any way. So it's nice to have the constraint framework uh, as a way of, uh, of expressing more formally what that would look like. Uh, and we can then use that to explore some of the consequences of this kind of idea. Um, in addition, as I said, I think this approach to some degree takes the mystery out of, out of the idea of governance. So uh, one objection to governance style uh, pictures of lawhood has always been that this notion of governance is a bit mysterious and mag like magical thinking or perhaps theistic. Um, but in this picture, governance just becomes a modal property and is thus no more mysterious than any other modal, modal properties. Um, of course, there are people who also, who also claim to find modal properties mysterious, but for those of us who are willing to accept the existence of objective modality, this at least allows us to accommodate governance within our, within our notion of objective modality and thus uh, makes, it, makes it not too difficult to conceptualize. Uh, finally, I think this account to some degree may help take the edge off the problem of induction, because if, if laws apply all at once to the whole of history, rather than sort of locally and independently at each instance, then we have a good principle reason why we should expect to see consistency across the whole of history. Uh, to be clear, uh, I'm not claiming that this solves the problem of induction, because of course, in the constraint framework, one can still formulate a law which has some, of it, some effect up to some time and then some totally different effect or just ceases to work after that time. So the constraint framework certainly doesn't prove that the future is going to look like the past. Uh, but nonetheless, it at least means we don't have to worry about how it is that laws know to act in the same way at different instances or what exactly it is that coordinate makes all their different instances across the course of history, because we now have to think about the laws as acting all in one go rather than distinctly in all these different places. So some examples. Uh, first off, we, uh, because we wanted this approach to be more general than existing approaches, we should require that it at least can accommodate the laws that earlier approaches could accommodate, and therefore we should ask whether it can accommodate time evolution laws. Uh, and indeed, it's quite straightforward to write time evolution laws in this form. Uh, a deterministic time evolution laws just, law just gets converted to a constraint uh, consisting of mosaics in which all the relevant systems have histories which are dynamically possible according to the time evolution laws. 
Um, and similarly, an indeterministic time evolution law could just be written as a probability distribution of the constraints of this kind. So all of the standard time evolution laws that we, that we are used to analyzing with other approaches to law which can also very straightforwardly be accommodated in this framework. But of course, as desired, we can also accommodate a wide range of non-time evolution laws. So, for example, uh, Lagrangian, Lagrangian laws can be accommodated straightforwardly. Uh, a law requiring that some Lagrangian is optimized simply becomes a constraint consisting of mosaics in which all relevant systems have trajectories which optimize the Lagrangian. Uh, similarly, we can get we can uh, we can get a form of rich causality quite straightforwardly in this framework. Uh, indeed, there's a sense in which uh, retro causality is just generic in all at once style uh, style approaches, uh, because in an all at once picture. Since the whole of history is selected all at once, it's not the case that the past generates the future and not vice versa. Uh, rather, the past and the future depend on one another in a mutual and reciprocal way. And thus, insofar as we have any Ford's causality, we also have retro causality. Um, now, this is probably not what most people think of when they hear the word retro causality. I think people, have, people tend to have in mind a more dynamical picture where we have, where we have some sort of forward dynamics and some backwards dynamics. Um, but as I've argued elsewhere, that picture seems somewhat incoherent and leads to a bunch of paradoxes. So I actually think that the all at once uh, way of conceptualizing retro causality is the only coherent way to do it. And therefore, the constraint framework is getting the analysis right. Uh, finally, we can consider constructor laws like the ones uh, proposed by Deutsch and Maletto. Those laws take the form of, of saying that some constructor is possible or impossible. Uh, and by possible, uh, by impossible here, they don't mean that, that the process associated with the constructor never occurs, but rather that that, that process can't be implemented uh, reliably in a cycle. So that is, of course, inspired by certain formulations of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and we can write that kind of law in the constraint framework by translating it to the constraint consisting of all mosaics in which the relevant type of process indeed does not occur in a cycle. Um, so I could go on, but these are examples are ad adequate to show that we can indeed, we, the, this framework is quite powerful and can indeed capture a wide variety of possible laws um, as one might want. So uh, as I said at the start, uh, the idea of this uh, this framework is not merely to answer the question, question of what are laws of nature, but also to provide uh, a framework which will be useful as we go on to answer other questions in, in physics and philosophy. Uh, in particular, if we are indeed going to move away from the time evolution, evolution paradigm, uh, that has a wide range of consequences for a variety of topics in physics and philosophy, uh, because, the, because the time evolution paradigm is implicit in many of the ways that we think about various topics in the philosophy of science, uh, and thus there's quite a lot of work to be done in kind of digging up, digging up the ways in which uh, it has infiltrated our ways of thinking uh, and trying to understand what happens if we get rid of it. So one natural application to, to ex examine is the question of what happens to determinism in a non-time evolution context. So determinism is most commonly understood uh, in terms of Laplacian determinism, which says that theory is deterministic if the initial state plus the laws are together sufficient to determine the entire course of history. Uh, and that Laplacian formulation is clearly not going to work very well once we move beyond the time evolution paradigm. So, for example, suppose uh, suppose I have a theory which says that the initial state plus the final state plus the laws of nature are, are fully are together sufficient to determine everything that happens in between. That theory does not satisfy Laplacian determinism since the initial state is not sufficient to determine the course of history. But nonetheless, it seems to me that there's a, a very real sense in which that theory is somehow deterministic. After all, the boundary conditions plus the laws are sufficient to determine the course of history. And therefore, it seems reasonable to think that we, sh we should have a definition of determinism, which allows us to say that that kind of thing counts as determinism in some sense. So there are some, there have been some proposals to generalize Laplacian determinism, particularly in the context of general, general relativity, because we saw earlier that uh, in non-globally hyperbolic universes, time evolution formulations will not in general be possible. And thus, uh, we have to say something a bit more subtle about what determinism would look like in general relativity. Um, but these formulations are usually what I call region-based formulations. Uh, the idea is basically just to replace the initial state with some other region of space-time and ask, is the information in this region of space-time adequate to fully determine the contents of the rest of space-time? Uh, that is an improvement, but I don't think it goes far enough because it is still basically based on this underlying metaphysical picture of starting with some state and then generating the rest. Um, 
And then in the kind of all at once context where we think of the laws as selecting the entire course history all at once, there's really no reason to think that there will be any region of space time which is enough to generate all the rest. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it seems possible that, we, that there are ways in which these sorts of non-time evolution theories could still be deter deterministic. So I think we need a different generalization of determinism, which is able to uh, make sense of make sense of the possibility of determinism, even if we're not dealing with a picture of some region determining all the rest. Uh, moreover, I think this, this is quite important because determinism has, has been a very important heuristic for science for a very long time. Uh, deterministic theories are in some sense seen as the gold standard. They're, they're what we'd really like to aim for. Um, and that we know that we're finished if we've arrived at a deterministic theory. Uh, conversely, in cases where we fail to come up with a deterministic theory, as in quantum mechanics, uh, many people are, have been unsatisfied and have continued searching for a deterministic completion of the theory. So if we're going to move away from the time evolution paradigm, uh, we need to, we, we're going to need some replacement for that heuristic, something that tells us what we're aiming for and how we'll know when, when we're done. Uh, and I think that so some suitable replacements can indeed be derived within the constraint framework. Uh, indeed, uh, there are several possible generalizations of determinism which may all be suitable for different contexts. Uh, so the common idea shared by all of these uh, generalizations is, is the, the idea of holistic determinism, uh, which says that all the laws should be associated with trivial distributions. That is to say, every law is simply associated with a single constraint, um, and therefore we don't have to invoke any probabilities or objective chances in the definition of the laws. The laws simply pick, pick out some intersection from which the uh, from which the mosaic must be drawn. Uh, that I think that. Th that deserves to be called a form of determinism precisely because it involves no probability or objective chance, uh, and, and therefore it is consistent with the idea that, that in determinism, that in deterministic theories, we have no probabilities or objective chances. Uh, but there are several uh, further elaborations one could make on that definition. So the first is what I call strong holistic determinism, where in addition to requiring that the laws are all associated with trivial distributions, uh, we also require that the, the intersection of the resulting constraints contains exactly one mosaic. So what that means is that laws of nature um, determine uniquely the course of history. Uh, there's no freedom at all to, to choose anything about the course of history because the laws only allow one possible human mosaic. So that I think, is clearly a form of determinism. Indeed, it's a very strong form of determinism and perhaps too strong uh, because in the Laplacian case, of course, we don't demand that the laws of nature should determine the course of history uniquely. We allow that there may be some arbitrariness in the selection of initial conditions and those initial conditions play the role of deciding which one out of the various dynamically possible histories in fact, uh, is, in fact represents the real course of history. Um, so, so we should perhaps allow for that, that kind of arbitrariness in our uh, in our formulation of determinism in the non-time evolution context as well. Uh, and that motivates the second definition of weak holistic determinism. Uh, so here, again, we require that all the laws are associated with trivial distributions. So that is to say, uh, every law simply induces a single constraint. Uh, but we now allow that the intersection of those constraints contains more than one human mosaic. So, one, so a mosaic must be selected in some way from that intersection. Uh, note that it's important at this at this stage that we define laws in such a way that they don't assign probability distributions over the mosaics in the, within constraints, uh, because that means that in, in, within this picture, the laws single out some set of some set of mosaics which are in the intersection of the constraints, uh, but don't assign any probability distribution over them. Uh, so therefore, we don't have objective chances and probabilities. We just have an arbitrary selection, uh, which is entirely analogous to the arbitrary selection of initial conditions in the usual picture of Laplacian determinism. So weak holistic determinism is in many ways very closely analogous to Laplacian determinism, except that it doesn't, uh, doesn't privilege an initial state. That said, there are some slightly odd consequences of, of weak holistic determinism. In particular, um, one, can imagine, uh, one can imagine a world in which we have a, a, some patch of space-time such that knowing all, all the contents of space-time outside that patch uh, is still not enough to determine what goes on inside that patch. Um, that's still weakly holistic and deterministic, provided that the laws don't assign any probability distributions on what's going on in that patch. Uh, what's going on in there is, is, is purely arbitrary in the same way as the selection, selection of initial conditions. Um, but although there are no objective chances or probabilities involved there, there's still something a bit weird about supposing that worlds having all these sort of arbitrary patches all over the place uh, count as deterministic. 
Um, so that motivates a third definition, which aims to, to distinguish between these sort of these worlds with arbitrary patches uh, and worlds which are deterministic in the more trad traditional Laplacian sense. And that's delocalized probabilistic determinism, uh, which requires that all the laws should be associated with trivial distributions again. Um, and we now allow, we allow that there may be more than one uh, mosaic in the, in the intersection of the constraints, uh, but we now require that there's no pair of mosaics in that intersection, uh, which are identical everywhere except on some small patch of space time. So that means that we can't have uh, mosaic, we can't have, have worlds containing small undetermined patches. Uh, and more generally, uh, if there is any arbitrariness in the selection of mosaics from the, from the, from the intersection, that arbitrariness can't be localized in any region of space time. It has to be kind of spread over, over all of space time in the same way that we see in traditional Laplacian determinism. So that definition succeeds in distinguishing between uh, Laplacian determinism and these, these weird worlds with undetermined patches, uh, but it does that in a way that doesn't require us to assign any special role to the initial states, and thus it is uh, compatible with the, with the non-time evolution context. So these uh, three three approaches uh, uh, make at least a start to start on um, giving us an idea of what kinds of all at once laws we might be looking looking for um, and what determinism might uh, what might count as determinism uh, in the, in the non time evolution context. Um, a second application is to the analysis of objective chance, um, and so the point I want to make here is that. Uh, the point I want to make here is that analyzing objective chances um, as uh, is, is that inside the, con the constraint framework, we have some new possibilities for ways of thinking about objective chances. So for example, suppose we have some law which says that uh, events of type E have outcome A with probability 0 0.8, and that's, that, uh, that probability is to be understood as an objective chance, as for example, uh, people often think quantum mechanics is. Um, we can, in the constraint framework, we have the option of analyzing that law in terms of a constraint consisting of the set of all mosaics in which 80% of events of type E have the outcome A. Um, and note that uh, this could be, one could require that to be exactly true or approximately true, depending on what the applications one had in mind. And so what's interesting about that is that this apparently probabilistic law gets turned into a non-probabilistic constraint. Uh, no objective chances are, are involved in the definition of this constraint. Uh, this constraint could perfectly well feature in a set of laws which are deterministic according to any of the three definitions we saw on the previous slide. So we have this kind of intriguing possibility of turning laws that look objectively chancy from our sort of local time evolution point of view into laws which are in fact perfectly deterministic and not chancy from this all at once point of view. Um, an idea that uh, rather similar to this was proposed by Roberts some time ago. Uh, Roberts referred to this as nomic frequentism, uh, and his idea was that. Um, that was that we should analyze objective chances in terms of laws which simply prescribe frequencies, so laws rather like this. And I think the constraint framework provides a really, really suitable home for that idea uh, and allows us to, to explore some of the consequences of it. Uh, one nice consequence of it is that it, it, in a sense, it reduces objective chance to just subjective probability. So if uh, we if we know that we are observing a sequence of events and the outcomes for the for the for that sequence. Uh, in fact, have pre-specified frequencies uh, imposed by the laws of nature, then what we're doing is really just sampling without replacement, right? In fact, this is really not so different from the standard textbook example that we've all seen in maths books, where you select a ball from a jar containing a specified mixture of black and white balls. Um, so in that, uh, so that, that kind of case is very well understood as a type of sub subjective probability. Uh, and this analysis allows us to reduce objective chances to just that kind of subjective probability, which is nice because uh, objective chances are still quite puzzling and arguably we don't have a good, good way of analyzing them yet. Whereas these kinds of subjective probabilities seem much easier to make sense of. Um, in addition, uh, I kind of showed in this paper that uh, this analysis of objective chance obeys most of the, the properties one would hope that an analysis of objective chance would have. So in particular, chances defined this way do seem to obey the principal principle. Uh, these chances are capable of empirical confirmation. Uh, the chances satisfy exchangeability, which is to say the order of events doesn't matter. Um, however, these chances don't satisfy counterfactual independence, which is the requirement that you would, you would naturally expect that the probability of getting an outcome on one event would be independent of the outcomes that you've seen on other events. Um, so that's a, a fairly counterintuitive feature. However, uh, note that if the number of events in the sequence is sufficiently large, the, uh, the deviation from counterfactual independence will be very small and indeed so small as to be indiscernible. Um, 
So provided that the number of events is large enough, we wouldn't expect to see any weird effects arising from this violation of counterfactual independence. And indeed, if the, if the set of events is infinite, there will be no deviation at all, and we will recover counterfactual independence. So I don't necessarily think that lack of counterfactual independence is, is an obstacle to seeing this as a viable in, uh, analysis of objective charts. Uh, that said, it's not necessarily my intention to argue that this, this analysis is the one true analysis of, analysis of all objective chances, but I do think it's a very interesting possibility, particularly in the sense that it allows us to uh, make objective, objectively chancing laws uh, into deterministic laws, and thus it does seem like a possibility worth exploring, and it's nice to see that the constraint framework provides a, a natural way to understand these kinds of constraints. So uh, to conclude, uh, I think, it, I think it's becoming quite clear if you look at modern physics that the time evolution evolution paradigm uh, needs to be put aside and we need to start exploring possibilities beyond that. Uh, and that fact has a variety of consequences uh, within both philosophy and physics. Um, to understand those consequences, consequences, it's important to have a way of thinking about lawhood, uh, which allows us to accommodate these non-standard time, not these non-standard laws, and which allows us to say that they are indeed possible laws. And I think that the constraint framework is an appropriate way of doing that, uh, which allows us to capture a large variety of possible laws, and does that in a way which is quite consistent with with uh, the way modern physics actually works. Um, moreover, what I want to emphasize is that whatever you think about Human laws versus governance laws. Uh, I hope that the analysis that I've given here does show that uh, we don't have to be humans to have flexibility and to be able to accommodate a large variety of possible laws. That kind of flexibility is achievable, with, achievable within the governance paradigm as well. And thus, uh, that is one a putative advantage for humanism that is not actually an advantage. Uh, and that, that's an important point to take in mind when we're discussing the pros and cons of the human and governance approaches. Finally, uh, I want to emphasize the, the idea of this framework was to be useful in applications to other topics in philosophy. So I've discussed here applications to determinism and objective chance. Uh, elsewhere, I've also used this framework to write about uh, operational theories of structural realism and retrocausality. And I have various other projects in mind. Uh, so the more I'd also be very interested to hear if anybody else has, has thoughts for interesting applications for this kind of, kind of approach. Uh, so, on that note, perhaps I should uh, stop talking and we can move to questions and discussion. Thanks so much, Emily. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, we did finish about five minutes early, so um, which has never happened before. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, why don't we start? Uh, well, I, I want to make sure to start the discussion at, at the hour because people are probably expecting to start it then. So. We'll just take a slightly longer break, if that's okay with everybody, and we'll reconvene uh, at exactly the hour. So just about 10 minutes, um, you know, and, and uh, please everyone come back, bring your questions, and you can start raising your hands when we all come back. All right, everybody, we're going to uh, start the discussion in Q&A. Um, this uh, next part will be recorded. If you'd like to ask a question and, and not be recorded, please send me the questions of a private chat. Uh, and I'll read your question aloud again anonymously if, if you'd like, but please indicate that in, 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 in your chat message. Uh, otherwise, we're going to take questions in the order um, that people have raised their hands. Um, I'm going to try to make sure people have enough time to, to ask their questions. Um, and I'm also going to prioritize people who haven't already asked questions. So if you have more than one question, I'll ask if you can please lower your hand and go to the end of the queue for your subsequent questions. If you have um, a, a brief follow-up to uh, an ongoing question, please indicate that in the chat. Um, good. So I think with, with that, let's get started with questions. Um, so the first question I have is from uh, Nan Singh. Please go ahead. Um, thank you, Emily, for the wonderful talk. So uh, my question is that, uh, so although you uh, you insist that you're not human, but the, the version of the constraint that you in the applications, for example, the determinism and the probability, at least the weaker versions of the constraint that you mentioned, it sounds to me quite compatible with the Humean view of law. So can you say more about what is the difference with the, yeah, the delocalized or the weaker version of the constraint? So the, one of the main differences with uh, I mean, this view and a Humean view is that this approach says that there could be many different sets of constraints which would all be compatible with the same Humean mosaic. So, you know, one set is, if my Humean mosaic is mosaic A, 
one set of constraints that's compatible with that is the set just consisting of A, but another set of constraints is, uh, that this is the constraint A plus B and the constraint A plus C. So both of those sets of constraints will single out A uniquely as the correct Kimian mosaic, but they are different sets of constraints. And so in that, in that sense, this approach doesn't satisfy Humean supervenience because it says that the constraints that uh, determine the, the course of history are not fully determined by the Humean mosaic itself. Uh, so it's 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 non-human in the sense that it goes beyond the human mosaic. It postulates something else, which 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 specifies what human mosaic we end up with. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next, I have Peter. Peter, go ahead. Thanks, Emily. Um, I just have a, a quick clarification question. Are they, are you talking about? You describe probability point eight as a constraint on frequency, um, but then earlier on you were talking about um, well, in the indeterministic case, we'll need laws to be a probability distribution over constraints. And I was wondering wondering why both of those were in there. I I, I wasn't sure why they were, why they were both necessary. So that so they're not strictly speaking both necessary. Um... I include them both because I'm trying to allow for both possibilities, uh, because I'm not necessarily convinced that this frequency constraint view is, is the correct way to think about probability. I think it's one possible and very interesting way to think about objective chances, but I don't want to have an approach which says that you know, objective chance is just impossible and there's no such thing. So the, the having probability distribution over constraints allows those people who believe in objective chances to, to define genuinely probabilistic laws. Um, but if you don't like objective chances, then you do have the option of, of going down this frequency constraint route. And that has some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, but I'm trying to sort of be general enough to allow both of those views. Okay, cool, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Eddie, you're next. Hi, Emily. Um, so, you know, I'm very sympathetic to uh, this framework views, and uh, I like your presentation a lot. Um, so my question is similar to the, the one I asked by Peter about probabilities. Mm -hmm. And I was also not sure about how normally frequentism of Roberts um, mm -hmm. coheres with or compatible with uh, the distribution over constraints. But uh, I guess the one I just clarify was helpful to me. Um, but I was wondering, um, so there is this, tension, I guess, in the laws of constraints where laws governed by constraint framework. That is, if laws governed by constraining, then how do probabilities come in? Yeah. Are they a kind of constraints or are they kind of something else? If it's something else, then the laws as constraint framework is not general enough. So the, I, I think the kind of the desire is to unify probabilistic laws somehow using constraint framework. And I think the two options provided are uh, interesting. But I was wondering if, um, um, the probability distribution over constraints and thinking of constraint laws, the determination laws as limiting case of uh, probabilistic laws will be maybe too limiting <laughs> in some sense, because uh, one might think that if cons categorical constraint is intelligible, right? Whether something is possible or impossible, that's clear and intelligible to me, yeah. human or non-humans. Um, you might still think that a distribution over constraints or degree of constraints or some numbers over constraints um, those notions are much less intelligible. Um, so uh, defining deterministic laws as a limiting case of constraint uh, as probabilistic laws, that seems to basically take away the core intelligibility of the constraint notion. Yeah, I, I more or less agree with that point of view. And I, I personally would be very happy if we could eliminate objective chances and just have constraints that say certain things are possible or, or impossible. Um, I, the, the reason I don't just do that is because I don't know if I don't know if that is a thing that we can do. Um, I think the frequency constraint view is is very interesting, uh, but I don't I'm not yet convinced that it's fully sufficient to account for all of the ways in which we use probabilities. Um, and so I do want and also I want to be able to sort of have a meaningful definition of determinism without building determinism into the into the framework. So I think it's perfectly it would perfectly be, be it would be perfectly fair to make the kind of argument you've just made and, and say, therefore, I conclude that I believe that all laws are in fact deterministic because those are the only coherent ones. I would have a lot of sympathy for that, uh, but I wanted to make the, the definition wide enough that we can at least say what it would mean for a to be deterministic. So regarding normal frequentism, I think that's the closest way to reduce improbabilities to constraints, right? I'm kind of wondering, curious about your uh, reservations about that view. I have some reservations myself, it's kind of wondering what you think about that view, uh, why it might not be sufficient. 
yeah um so as I said, it has a slightly weird consequence in terms of the, 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 the loss of counterfactual independence. Um, and although in most cases one would expect that if there's large numbers of events, we wouldn't see right. that, it does have the, the strange consequence that if, if we encounter objective chances over some small number of events, we should sort of see weird correlations across time. Mm -hmm. And so one may or may not be willing, willing to accept that view. Um, uh, also, depending on if you define it in, in a way that requires the frequencies to be exact, you then have issues where you can can only have certain numbers of of, of events because otherwise you wouldn't get um, you wouldn't be able to get appropriate factorization appropriate factors to work. So you know if you have if you say exactly eighty percent of all events um, must have a certain outcome, then you need to be able to then zero point eight times the number of events has to be a, a an integer. So so that again has, has quite, quite a strange idea that that the laws would somehow prescribe the number of such events. So I don't think those things are necessarily insuperable, but I think perhaps there's, there's work to be done to fully figure out the consequences of that and decide whether that is, whether we're satisfied with this as an analysis of objective chance or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks, that's helpful. I have a quick follow up on that. So, you know, of course, in in, in quantum mechanics, there are strange correlations between things, right? Yes. And 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 you know, if you attempt to account for those, you know, with, uh, you, you know, um, you know, something like uh, a Beables type framework, you know, in, in some, it, it, and you, and you, 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 you are, um, you know, un, un, unwilling to go the route of assuming like uh, non-local causation between things, then one route is something like, you know, super determinism, something like that, right? And that seems very unnatural uh, on a view of laws that's sort of a dynamically productive view, but from a, a, a sort of all at once constraining uh, paradigm for laws, it doesn't seem so obviously uh, out of bounds anymore, right? That there could be, um, uh, you know, the, the, these sort of uh, gnomic frequentist uh, pictures of, of, of how the Born rule is implemented and how the, the probabilistic rules of quantum mechanics are, are implemented. And then precisely, we do lose counterfactual independence, but kind of in in the way that we would need. Um, so I'm wondering if if that if 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 that's you know come to your mind as, as you're thinking about this at all. Yeah, I didn't emphasize this in the talk, but I do think all at once approaches are a very natural way to make sense of non-locality because if the course of history is selected all at once in this way, you would generically expect events at different spatial locations to depend on each other. And indeed, in this kind of framework, the question is not why do we have non-locality, but why don't we have more non-locality? Um, so th there's, there's a nice sort of synergy between the expectation of non-locality and the all-at-once picture. Um, with, with respect to counterfactual independence, it's a little bit less clear because we don't see violations of counterfactual independence in quite the sense you would expect in quantum mechanics. So, you know, if you perform a series of quantum mechanical, mechanical measurements, you don't expect the result of one measurement to depend on the result of the previous one unless you do unless you use the same system or something. So we don't see that we don't seem to see that the kind of violations of counterfactual independence that you might expect to arise from gnomic frequentism. Um, but as I say, it provides that the number of events is large enough, you wouldn't expect to be able to see that anyway, because the, the difference would be so small that you would never notice. Um, so provided that all the types of quantum events we, we, we're observing occur very many times, uh, that's certainly not incompatible with the empirical evidence that we have. Great, thanks. Um, Eddie, do you have a follow-up to this, or is your question a new question for the end of the queue? Uh, new question. Okay, the end of the queue. Um, Richard, please go ahead. Anyway, um, excellent talk as usual. I'm very sympathetic to your attempt to broaden the framework of candidates for laws um, beyond dynamical laws. Um, but I'm a little worried about how it's going to work and the status of the modal structure as, uh, as reflected in, in a, an extension or constraint on human mosaics. Um, yeah. uh, there are, Several related worries. Um, uh, at one point, you seem to be suggesting that the move from laws to, to constraints is going to be epistemically um, a good move to make. Um, and, and I wasn't sure that was right because model structure seems to be just as epistemically inaccessible as dynamical laws. Um, uh, and um, at one point, you said that um, the constraints which function as metaphysically 
necessitating a, a, a certain some restrictions on something like human mosaics. And, and that got me even more worried because I, I'm not a fan of metaphysical necessity in general. Um, and I'm not sure that you can assume that somebody is going to give you all of the human mosaics that you can then chop down. Uh, it, it seems that there's a reason uh, to suppose that what counts as a human mosaic is, is partly um, intertwined with what counts as a constraint, um, which is going to make things much messier. Um, and, and just one final uh, remark, rather than a separate question. Um, the, uh, you, you brought in constructor theory, which is, is certainly something that should be uh, discussed here. But I get really worried when I think of um, principles of constructor theory as principles governing what is metaphysically impossible to construct. That sounds to be a very strange notion. Um, metaphysical impossibility or possibility is, is bad enough, but construction, that sounds uh, very, very sort of practical. Um, and perhaps it's not intended that way, but that I have worries about how to, how to distance it from the practical art of going into the laboratory and trying to build something. Yeah, so a couple of points there. Um, first off, I agree that this definition is definitely very sensitive to what you allow to be included in your Humean mosaic. Uh, if you put different types of properties in your Humean mosaic, that will affect the, the scale of what types of laws you're able to formulate. Um, and indeed, in, in a sense, one can regard different, could potentially regard constraints as narrowing, first narrowing down the set of Humean mosaics and then uh, both in terms of what's in them and, and of what kinds of things are in them. Um, so I, the reason I didn't didn't go into sort of greater detail as to what is contained in the human mosaic was was precisely because the idea is for the framework to be reasonably general and to be able to respond to the kinds of laws that this is postulating. So the hope is that we can kind of update our ideas of what the human mosaic might contain as as science postulates new things that the human mosaic might contain, uh, and and still be able to use the same overall approach to laws of nature, even if that leads to different different laws as we change our human mosaics. Um, with regard to metaphysical necessitation, uh, it, it, it's, it's not my intention to, to argue that the laws themselves are metaphysically necessary. Uh, rather, I was trying to uh, use metaphysical necessitation to characterize the modal relation of governance. So um, in, in the sense that, that well, what a constraint does, it does, does is it requires that, as it says that every world uh, which, which is subject to a certain constraint must have a human mosaic which belongs to a certain set. Um, what that means is that if, if a world is subject to a certain constraint, it is then metaphysically necessitated that it should have certain properties because that's that's what that constraint means. Um, but but I'm, I'm not claiming that the constraints themselves are metaphysically necessary, so I wouldn't claim that constructors, constructor laws are metaphysically necessary. But it is metaphysically necessary that if the world is, is subject to a certain constructor law, then it has certain properties. Um, so, so the metaphysical necessity is characterizing the modal structure imposed by the laws, but the laws themselves are not necessary. Uh, okay, so, so I don't have to worry about uh, what it means to say that it's metaphysically impossible to construct something. No, no, that's, that's not what the, the claim is that if, if the law is, if a world is subject to a certain constructor law, what that means is that, that it's part of the meaning of that law that you can't have certain, certain things being constructed. So there's a metaphysical relation there, but the law itself is not necessary. Okay, that's all for now, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Um, next, I have Jared. Hi, Emily. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, similarly to Richard, I'm also interested in the role that uh, modal structure is playing, um, and specifically modal realism. Yeah. Um, so, so I know I know that you said that you didn't want to like make uh, hard commitments about uh, what's doing the grounding uh, here, uh, mm -hmm. but I was curious to hear a little bit more about what you uh, consider to be like the space of possibilities, right? Like um, uh, whether we need to be uh, uh, think that worlds exist concretely, possible worlds exist concretely uh, on this account or merely abstractly. Um, or in particular, what I had in mind was um, maybe you're a nominalist and you want to reduce the truth makers of modal claims to powers at the end of the day, and then we come back around to the powers account. Um, but of course, the worries that you have about powers might still apply then just back to that account. Um, so I was just curious if you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah, um, that's a good point. Uh, I obviously want to avoid any account of modality, which is 
too restrictive and which rules out the kinds of modal structure which I, I have attempted to define here. Um, and I would I don't think that there's any reasonable way to, to regard the kind of constraints that I have suggested as being powers of anything. And therefore I would, for that reason, rule out the, a kind of any kind of approach to modal structure which requires them to be powers. Uh, similarly, anything that's too restrictive and doesn't allow the kinds of modal structures I'm using here to be to, to be modal structure would, would, would be ruled out on that basis. Uh, beyond that, I really want to avoid committing to any, any particular account of modality. For the reasons reasons that I, I set out, I don't necessarily see a, see a good way of de of determining what the modal structure that grounds constraints is, and uh, nor do I think it's necessary to make metaphysical claims about that to make sense of this this kind of way of thinking about lawhood. Um, I, I, I'm not personally inclined towards the view that says that we have to think about laws or laws that think about possible worlds as being concrete existence, um, but for those people who like to like to understand modality that way, I, there's no uh, there's no reason they shouldn't think about this, these modal structures in that in that way. Um, but the hope is to be you know, flexible enough to to be applicable within most accounts of modality, unless those accounts explicitly kind of are incompatible with the types of modal structures I'm using here. Great, uh, thanks, um, Carrie. Please go ahead. Carrie, can you hear sorry. me? Yes, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no sorry. I was asking if you could hear me about having my mic on mute. The answer <laughs> no, uh, or should be no. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for the talk. <clears throat> so I wanted to ask you um, a kind of open, pretty open, open-ended question uh, to try and figure out how what what you're proposing here fits mm -hmm. in some sort of things I've always thought, but haven't haven't really worked up too into much um, too rigorously. So I've always had this feeling um, that so you started off talking about the kind of standard metaphysics of laws, you know, we get from Armstrong and, and so on. Um, and that all of these the these philosophical kind of um, discussions, these sort of present, you know, in in the first instance, a law of nature as something like all ravens are black. Right. Um, it's very, very much based fundamentally on the idea of laws as something that relates properties. Right. And this no doubt comes from the sort of logical positivists who try to represent everything in physics in terms of logic, right? Predicate logic. Um, and then so they, they start off with that as a template, and then they try to refine it by sort of remembering that these properties involved are actually magnitudes. Right, so you have Armstrong kind of bending over backwards to try and give uh, a theory of what um, you know his theory of governing looks like when you remember that you know mass and and, and charge and all the rest of it are actually have have this kind of have this mathematical structure associated with them. Um, so I've always felt that by kind of predicating our theory of laws by starting off with this understanding that there's something propositional based on properties and then trying to kind of build the idea that actually laws of physics are really mathematical um, around that, it gives us this kind of illusion that there's much more modal freedom than there actually is, because it sort of messes out this really essential element of mathematical constraints that is completely just enmeshed with the notion of a, a law in physics, right? So to give a kind of example, when Armstrong starts talking about, um, starts remembering that quantity, that properties are quantities, uh, he gives a theory of structural universals. So mass corresponds to a universal that literally has a structure that is like a meriological structure that is isomorphic to um, uh, the real line starting at zero, I guess. Um, and given how given how Armstrong thinks about universals, or um, or anyone I think thinks about universals, that means that mass is going to cart around this mathematical structure in every possible world in which it appears. So as I've argued in some of my stuff, um, well, you know, what goes for mass must go for the other properties. So it must go for things like quark color, right? You think of that as the basis, what's what's color, you know, what, what's red and green and whatever, right? That's, well, that's a basis vector 
in the irreduc a fundamental irreducible representation of the SU3 group. So by the same token, it seems that wherever you have quarks, right, you should, these things should behave in accordance with laws that have that sort of SU3 structure. And as you will know, once you start seeing things like that, um, you really, really start pen sort of um, massively constraining what the forms of those laws are. Um, and kind of leaving aside all sorts of what on some measures would be a priori possibility. Certainly for Lewis, who thinks you can just recombine these quarks and come up with laws that, you know, are pretty arbitrary. Um, so it's always seemed to me that there is a kind of, you know, on the one hand, um, when you think of properties as having this mathematical structure, um, they're way more constrained in the way that those properties, the laws that they can appear in, right, the mathematical structure that those laws can have. But on the other hand, it's possibly it might be human, right? And so far as those constraints are mathematical constraints and logical mathematical necessities are supposedly okay for humans, right? It's this, you know, um, the notion of natural necessity is not, you know, supposed to be its own kind of category, but it's not its own category when you remember that nature itself is mathematical, right? So maybe you can be a human and recognize all these kinds of constraints when you remember, when, when you kind of, um, just sign up to the idea that these fundamental properties have this mathematical structure associated with them. It's not just the laws that have structure, but the properties, right? Certainly that at least is something that Armstrong would say. Um, so how does that sort of little spiel about how properties and laws intersect, how does that, if at all, connect with what you're proposing with regard to this sort of um, non-human constraints, constraining idea of laws as that leads away for a kind of not governance, but um, some kind of really non-trivial modal constraint. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about this a lot, but I, it does seem to me that there's kind of a continuity there be, between mathematical constraints and the constrained approach of lawhood that perhaps is missing from uh, the Armstrong um, type pictures. Uh, um, because constraints on, on what is mathematically possible still have the same kind of, of overall form in terms of what uh, what is and is not possible. And thus you can kind of, I, I would hope that you can sort of see these mathematical constraints as being a bit more on a spectrum with the, the other, other physical constraints and thus achieve perhaps more and more, more unified picture of, of how mathematical constraints and physical constraints kind of combine to give us the human mosaic. Um, and, and so in, in that sense, I would I would hope that perhaps this framework might be a more natural home for, for thinking about, about the way in math, which mathematical constraints enter into what kinds of laws we can even define. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and for example, one can sort of see constraints as being subsets of other constraints. So one uh, in, in a sort of sort of straightforward set membership way, and thus you know you can sort of see see a mathematical constraint as uh, being the larger constraint and then physical constraints kind of belonging to that set and being being restrictions, further restrictions on what is mathematically possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, uh, next, I have Yamima. Hi. So I'm very sympathetic to the idea of constraints, but I, I have two questions and they are interrelated. And the first one really goes back to Carrie's question whether you have any criterion of this for distinguishing between mathematical constraints and physical constraints. Uh, for example, Pauli's principle, uh, Mark Steiner and Mark Lang and me all have different views of the status of Pauli's principle and it may be important. And that is related to the second question because I'm not sure one can be as neutral as you want to be with regard to the Jungian mosaic, because if the constraints are mathematical, we know where they come from, and there is no question of how they arise. If we are Jungian, then even the non-mathematical constraints, laws of nature is non-mathematical constraints, there's no worry about where do they come from, how, in what sense are they more fundamental? Did they emerge from, the, from some lawless situation? Um, but if you are a union, then this question doesn't arise, right? Because all these constraints are just our way of summing, summing up the facts in a useful way. So I don't really think we can remain neutral between Lewis's approach and Maudlin's, say, approach. Mm 
Yeah, and, and indeed, I, I don't intend to remain neutral. I, I prefer the governance-based approach, and that, that's the reason for this project was to try to find a governance-based approach, which is a better fit for, for modern physics than, than many of the existing governance-based approach. So I, I, I do intend to take a, take a stand against humanism here. Um, uh, with regard to mathematical, the distinction between mathematical and physical constraints, um, there's a sense in which some mathematical constraints are built into the definition, because basically, uh, if one if one defines laws as sets of Humean mosaics, then it immediately follows that none of the laws can be inconsistent because a Humean mosaic can't contain anything that is inconsistent. So whatever the law says, it can't possibly require anything to happen that is inconsistent. So some uh, some some forms some forms of mathematical constraints will then be be built into the constraint framework purely because no constraint can ever be mathematically inconsistent. Um, but but you're right. There is a difference between mathematical constraints and physical constraints in this picture because the mathematical constraints are 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 about what is you know meta metaphysically possible, whereas the the constraints are regarded as adding something to that and 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 saying something further about what is physically possible within a possible world. Um, and I, I'm I mean I'm reasonably comfortable with the idea that there are both math mathematical constraints and physical constraints, and they may be sort of continuous in some way, but they are different and play different roles. Thanks. Thanks, Yamuma. Um, so I, I know that Eddie and, and Richard have their hands up before Lev, but Lev hasn't asked a question yet. So Lev, please go ahead. I'm uh, maybe very conservative and I don't like uh, constraint. I like uh, laws which uh, govern. I think the best theory is Newtonian theory. We can put particles in every position we want whatsoever, no constraint whatsoever. We had few laws of interaction and given a complete description, we know what will happen. Now I teach analytical mechanics and then I, I say we have Lagrangian and we have this minimal action. Uh, for me, it's a theory. I can, it's a property. And I think um, there are, I don't know, maybe it's not clear how to count this uh, number of laws, uh, but to state it, I need to uh, have initial and final condition, and then they'll say that uh, always the motion will be according to this, but uh, I need initial and final. I think it's not natural. It, the natural is to take a complete description now and to ask what will happen, to not to take all possible pairs. Now, if I go to electrodynamics, I cannot have this uh, this paradigm because I can put charges whenever I want. But uh, I learned that uh, it looks like I, it's not enough to put charges and it fields. And if I then put fields, then I have um, uh, Gauss law. And Gauss law, it's um, law about, uh, so my initial condition are constrained. I cannot put whatever I want in my ontology. Uh, so sometimes it's necessary, unfortunately, from my point of view, and uh, so this is what we have to do. Otherwise, this is, I think, my, my, seems to me the simplest way, if we can have theory, put initial condition without constraint and give laws and we'll tell what's going on. And sometimes we cannot do this, so we'll have to add constraint. Start with constraint and I, uh, I have to make too many statements about too many uh, situations. I think it's not natural to look on all these different situations. So first, I would emphasize that um, Newtonian laws and you know, initial state time evolution laws can also be written as constraints. So a time evolution law in that framework just becomes uh, a constraint consisting of all dynamically possi possible histories. Uh, so in that sense, constraints include the Newtonian possibilities uh, and also some broader possibilities. Uh, I also just don't necessarily agree that initial condition formulations are really the most natural or the, the inevitable way of thinking about laws. I think that idea is, is kind of a mistake that we have we make from inferring from the, the nature of our experience and assuming that the world has to work in the same way and it really has to be unrolling in some direction. Um, and I think that there's for the reasons I set out earlier in, early in the talk, there are many indications in modern physics to think that that's not really how things work and we shouldn't be so focused on initial condition formulations. So it's important to think about 
how we can make sense of laws if, if in fact the initial condition time evolution approach is not the right way to go. But the initial condition you don't like. What about final condition? From my point of view, the whole story is now I know I have a particular description of the world. And what all what I'm interested in to explain uh, the, the connection. Um, so if I go backward in time, I, take, I have laws which will tell me all the past. This is good enough. This is the whole story. And this is, again, this is a story you have a, a particular situation now, which this is what we have. And now we want to explain it. And the laws of the type of uh, governing will, can tell me um, how we arrive to now. And maybe we'll make some clues about what, what are possibilities. I think it's important to distinguish between laws which we are intending to use for some practical application and laws which we're intending in some sense to represent the structure of reality. So, of course, for practical reasons, we're often interested in writing down laws which will predict the near future from the state now. And I'm not saying we should stop doing that, but there are also good indications from a variety of places in physics that uh, to really understand the, the fundamental laws, we have to go beyond that approach and think about laws which perhaps don't have a time evolution formulation. In GR, for example, in many cases, there just is no time evolution formulation. So it's a mistake to think that we can always write down time uh, initial condition time evolution approaches, even though in many cases that our practical uh, interests are in finding those kind of formulations. Okay, I don't want to just, but to, to be sure, if I understand the philosophers usually trying to tell me is that the, what the, our task is to explain what the world is. And uh, I think uh, a limited question to explain uh, that uh, all the correlation on all our memories, which we have, if we can explain them well, this is good enough without knowing what the world is. So will you say that this is because you want the first one, then you are more for constraint? Well, my concern is that if we remain stuck in the time evolution picture, we might not. Uh, there, there may be possibilities which we're missing and when we try to do physics uh, and a, a broadening to a broader picture of what the laws might look like may potentially lead us to better formulations of the laws and to make progress on problems in physics. And that in turn may, may ultimately allow us to make to, to give better formulations of time evolution laws as well. And so, you know, in the long term, I would hope this would also be useful for those practical applications as well as for understanding the, the deep structure of things insofar as that is possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lev. Um, okay, so uh, I don't have any new people, so I'm going to go back to Eddie. Eddie, please go ahead. All right, thanks. Hi, Emily. So I have a question about simplicity. And yeah. I know you touched this a little bit in your talk in the paper version. Yeah. Um, so Humeans defines laws in terms of simplicity, among other virtues. But now Humeans, like you and me, can say simplicity is one of the many, say, as any guides for discovering evaluating lawfulness. Um, and it is not constitutive of laws because the laws may not be ultimately simple, but relatively speaking, among the competitors, empirical equivalent rivals, we should choose the one that's simpler, overall speaking, other things being equal. Um, I wonder what simplicity uh, is and is like and has status in your uh, framework. Um, is it merely a methodological principle or pragmatic principle or something more with epistemic significance? There's something wrong, say, of choosing, say, two theories equally well, save the phenomena, but uh, one is much more complicated than the other, right? Um, so there cannot be any empirical reasons. So the only choice be between them is going to be super empirical reason here. Is something epistemically wrong or is something that's merely pragmatic choice of our taste or aesthetics? And going back to an early point made by uh, Jacob regarding superdeterminism and this kind of general phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. So you and I think that uh, laws constrain and say the set of models of the law generated by the law is uh, just basically a set that including the actual world as a member. Yeah. But as long as you have actual world as a member, there are many ways to draw the line boundary between the set that includes the actual world. So there are many different constraints compatible with the same world, unless we assume some probability distribution, then there's no way to say one confirms, one better confirms over the other. So there has to be some super empirical element here in the choice or preference or decision over which one is the correct law. And um, my 
Um, so the, in the in paper with Sheldon Goldstein, I say that epistemic law guys are basically rational guys, right? Um, and it would be irrational to choose something else. So the response I have for sweet determinism, for example, is that the generic models with the interconditions that realize sweet determinism will be vastly more complicated than a one like Bohm or GFW or Everett. So that's the reason I sh we should not choose those models over the mainstream ones. And similarly for any uh, kind of gerrymandered initial conditions, uh, that should be dispreferred. But when you have the past hypothesis, if there are reason to think it can be captured by some simple way, then that's, that is acceptable. It may be preferred to other theories without the past hypothesis. So I was wondering if that's closer to your thinking or you think that that's too strong going to the epistemic direction. Yeah, I think I more or less agree with you. Um, and as you do, I don't think that simplicity should be constitutive of lawhood. Uh, one can define all sorts of constraints in this framework, which are not simple at all. And I don't think those should be ruled out from being possible laws. Um, but of course, we have no hope of, of discovering laws unless they are at least somewhat simple. Uh, and so it's kind of a, a condition of doing science that one just assumes laws are at least reasonably simple so that we're going to be able to discover them. Um, you know, why that should be as a, as a difficult question, but not one which I think we necessarily need to address here. Just as scientists, we've got to assume that there are simple laws and we can find them. Um, yes, with, I would but also more or less agree with your analysis of superdeterminism. Uh, I would also say that, in fact, superdeterminism seems unnecessary to me within this framework because, as I said earlier, non-locality is just entirely natural in this kind of all-at-once approach. If you select the whole history all at once, you should expect to see non-locality. So you don't need to invoke something like superdeterminism to explain where non-locality comes comes from, it's just a generic feature of, of, of worlds, worlds in this kind of framework. Um, yeah, so I, I, I did think once, once one makes that kind of move, it doesn't seem necessary to invoke something complicated like that. And that's assuming some kind of um, simplicity, don't multiply, um, say, complexity beyond necessity. But regarding to um, the simplicity again, so um, the point you made about induction in your slide, um, that um, the all at once framework can take the edge away from the problem induction. I was a bit surprised by that, but maybe I should understand it in the, in the sense that once you assume this principle of simplicity, this methodological or the principle of simplicity, then the all at once framework uh, might be thought of, suppose we have a simple constraint overall in entire space time, and that's not going to be very time dependent or uh, varying wildly over space time. That's going to basically um, support inductive generalizations. Uh, beyond what we can directly observe. Yeah, so it's definitely not my claim that that the all at once framework totally solves the problem of induction. One can still have you know, laws which do weird things or change at times or stop working. That that we can't rule that out. Um, so the, the claim about induction was more that if you think of laws as being kind of acting separately and independently every every time they are relevant. There's kind of a, a prima facie mystery about how they get coordinated and how they, how they know to act in the same way in all these different places. And in the all at once framework, uh, that particular problem is, is no longer really a problem because the law decides everything at once. So there's kind of coordination is not an issue. Um, there's, there's still a further question about why we, why we end up with constraints which have features which make induction possible, like being consistent across time. And yes, I, I would agree with you on that point that kind of the way to go there is to, to say on epistemic grounds, we've just got to assume that we're dealing with those kinds of constraints. Um, but yeah, in and of itself, the framework doesn't solve the problem of induction, but it does, it does perhaps help with this issue of how do things get coordinated across time. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. I have a somewhat related question. The issue of superterminism brings up this question of causation. I'm yeah. wondering if there, if you think there are any different ways we might think about causation in 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 this sort of constraint paradigm for laws, um, or or whether it, it really is just the same. Uh, yes, I, I've been writing about causation recently. Uh, I've been I've been using in particular the. Uh, process matrix framework uh, that is invoked in uh, quantum foundations and the process matrix framework fits really nice nicely into this kind of all at once constraint picture because it is a, a theory of what processes are possible and impossible and what consistency conditions are necessary um, and basically what emerges out of that framework is that consistency conditions most mostly tend to lead to the consequence that things need to occur in sort of a well-defined order and so we get a causal order arising in a sort of natural way out of, out of consistency conditions that can be built into a constraint framework um, 
and causal order isn't, isn't quite the same as causation in the standard sense. I, I would I would argue that causation in the standard sense arises from causal order at a at a higher level because um, the involvement of macroscopic considerations gives a direction to it. Um, but basically, uh, but but yeah, but basically, I, I think of causation as arising from these kinds of conditions plus plus some force of direction. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, next I have uh, Richard. Yeah, this is a, a question about uh, constraints. Um, the way you're approaching this issue is to take constraints to be constraining something like the new mosaics. Yeah. Uh, but there seem to be things uh, which are often called principles, including the no signaling principle, which, which seem to function not as much as constraints on, on a human world, but constraints on us. Uh, uh, don't construct theories which allow um, uh, superluminal signaling. Um, and there are other constraints that seem to function this way too. Uh, symmetry principles, uh, don't construct theories that violate uh, Lorentz invariance, for example, at least locally. Um, and maybe even don't worry about theories which are non renormalizable. That was a worry at a certain stage in the development of the standard model, for sure. Um, Coming back to the no signaling principle, it seems to me that what that constrains is not just our construction of theories, it's a constraint on possible interventions. Um, I, I think there's some reason to, to be suspicious of the thought that no signaling principle should count as a law. Uh, Bell said a number of things about you know, who are we uh, uh, and what can we do. Um, uh, so to think of the no signaling principle as a constraint on worlds rather than a constraint on us and our potential interventions might not be the right way of thinking about it. Um, now, I don't mean to say that, that um, it's wrong to think about constraints the way you do, but I think maybe you could broaden your perspective even further uh, and, and include also constraints on us and what we can do um, uh, and think of laws, at least some things that seem to be reasonable to talk of as laws, as um, principles guiding our activities, guiding our activities in constructing theories uh, and not constructing theories with dusty properties. Um, so what's your reaction to this uh, proposed uh, broadening of the notion of a constraint? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think very, very somewhat, somewhat vaguely, thinking of the human mosaic as also including agents performing various actions within it. So in that sense, the no signaling principle would, would include the fact that there are no agents performing signaling and thus would, would act as a constraint, you know, not just on distribution of physical things, but on the, what agents can do because they are in a mosaic in which no agents can perform signaling. Um, but I, I agree there's sort of more, more thought perhaps needs to go into exactly how we identify agents within human mosaics um, and how we sort of understand how to the extent to which we need to make a distinction between constraints that apply specifically to agents and constraints which just apply to distributions of properties in, in a more straightforward way. Um, and there's also sort of questions about how to differentiate between sort of metho methodological principles and how to distinguish between uh, uh, between you know, physical principles and physical constraints. I and mean, I would argue that, you know, despite being somewhat methodological in, 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 in content, the no signaling principle is actually a physical constraint um, because what it means in particular is that um, it's not possible to, to, to use signal, signaling to construct closed loops, uh, which would lead to, loop, lead to paradoxes. And so in some sense, there's a sort of, there's a, an almost a, uh, it's almost a, a logical condition that we, we don't have the ability to, to construct those kinds of closed loops. Uh, so in that sense, I don't. I think the, the no signaling principle, although it can be regarded as asking us not to construct theories which don't which allow signaling, does also place some sort of non-trivial physical constraints on what can can and can't be possible in reality as well. Now that's putting a, a lot of uh, content into the uh, no signaling principle. The physical constraint, I would agree that uh, we should not uh, permit the theories that allow for contradictions. That's for sure. But that's not what the you know, signaling principle says. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have Jared, and then I have Mary. Jared, please. Yeah. Thanks. So this is actually a, a pretty direct follow-up to your conversations with Carrie and 
Yeah, maybe not. Uh, apologies, I wasn't quick enough with the finger. Um, but uh, in response to Yamima, you were saying that um, your account is distinguishing between concrete uh, or physical and mathematical properties. Uh, so now I'm just like trying to think, um, uh, fleshing this out via an abstract uh, approach um, uh, to modal realism. So is it the case that we are having abstracta playing the governing relation uh, with regards to uh, concreta? Um. I mean, I'm not necessarily sure that one one needs to think about modal structure as abstractive, um, but that is, I guess, one possible account. I'm not I'm not convinced that it's ine inevitable, but I, I guess a, a, like a brief, lightly critical follow up to that would be like um, uh, this for me at least seems to sort of downplay the force of the governance analogy uh, in terms of what modal structure is doing, uh, push me more towards an OSR leaning account. So do you want to elaborate on that? I don't quite uh, see the, the connection there. Oh, so so my brief thought was that um, uh, I, I can see, I can get myself into a headspace where I'm very compelled by the idea of uh, mathematical properties governing mathematical properties, uh, sort of in the sense that Carrie was outlining with regards to an Armstrongian approach to these like mm -hmm. purely abstract relations earlier. Yeah. Uh, and I can get myself in a headspace where we have like uh, concrete properties like dispositions playing a governance relation with regards to uh, you know con other concreta. Uh, yeah. But I'm having a hard time personally for myself motivating um, the abstract to concrete direction. Uh, and so if I'm going to take something like an abstract approach to uh, cashing out the metaphysics of truth makers for modal facts, uh, I tend personally to fall more back into an OSR style of uh, it's well, it's just the abstract structure that is that is the nature of the world. Uh, but I'm curious if, if uh, you would take a different path along there along that line. Yeah. Um, so I think kind of cru crucial to the idea of modal structure is that it you know, has an effect on, con on concrete entities. Uh, so I think however one is going to analyze modal structure, one should do that in such a way that that one is, is comfortable with the idea that that is what modal structure do, that it, that it determines the behavior of concrete to concrete things. Um, so it, uh, if, if, one, if one thinks everything has to be divide, just divided between either being concrete or being abstract, and one thinks you can't have governance passing between them, then yes, I would agree that you should think of modal structure as being concrete in, in whatever sense that means means to you. Um, or you should, or you should think of both, you, or you should move in an OSR direction and say that everything is abstract. Um, but I, I think there's room to kind of maneuver between different accounts of what modal structure is and uh, how that's related to that abstract concrete distinction, provided that you come out at the end with an account of modal structure, which allows modal structure to determine what goes on in reality. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, Marion, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, I listened to your discussion, Emily, with uh, Chen, I think, and I realize that you take for granted that non-locality is a law of nature. It is not. It's uh, based and super determinist is uh, necessary. So I, you are not physicist and probably you don't follow all discussions about uh, super determinism. But recently, of course, for uh, decennies in principle, people were always saying that there is assumption in the derivation of Bell proof, which is called a free will assumption. And of course, it, instead, uh, the bell, if bell inequalities are violated, it means that some assumption has to be wrong. And in this case, this free choice, in this case, one solution could be non-locality or that there is super detaining uh, and the experimentalists don't have free choice uh, to choose the uh, settings. This is a completely mistaken interpretation of, of uh, assumption which tells that uh, experiments in four different settings can be uh, explained using one uh, uh, single unique probability space. And uh, in principle, this is, uh, in other words, that hidden variables depends on settings, which 
finally is should be more better called that it is uh, contextuality or the other recently is uh, people stop calling it free choice because they realized and even i think in uh, the article which you published in four folk uh, Sabine uh, Hofsenfender, the, uh, Hofsenfender so <laughs> probably has also articles uh, that also he was using the uh, term of super determinist, but in some sense she, uh, she was uh, clearly uh, understanding it that it has nothing to do with free will of experimenters. So if you, if you probably want to see more about it, you can uh, you see my name yeah and there is a paper in uh, entropy quite recent which is called contextually by default description of bell tests contextuality as a, a, a rule not as the exception i can put it on chat if you want and then you can find also with my name find other articles when when the, this problem is disco discussed so I, you are not physicists. This is why uh, I know that not only in physical, uh, but between physicists, it's a very common idea that uh, we, there is no escape from uh, uh, non-locality and things like this. But it's not true. Well, I used, to, I used to be a physicist. So I've heard this before. Um, I, I actually agree with you that free will is not a good good use of terminology. <clears throat> good terminology and the analysis of super determinism. Um, and you know, I, I think much of Sabine's work on this topic is, is good and is making very important points. Um, my, my main objection to super determinism is that I just find it unnecessary because I don't think non-locality is that much of a problem. Uh, I think non-locality seems quite natural and I'm not, I have no objection to it. Um, but, but yeah, I agree that super determinism is, is, a, is a viable option for those who would, would like to get rid of non-locality. Okay, thank you. I will put the, the name we, I gave you. I can put it on chat if you want as a name of article. But anyway, you can find it with my name. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as usual, I, I always have lots of questions, but I don't raise my <laughs> hand. And in case there's a lack of hands raised, I'll, I'll, I'll just ask my next question. Um, so, I know Eddie is going to, I think, particularly going to like this, this question. Um, but um, Taking a, a, a constraint view on, on laws and, and regarding those constraints as, as picking out sets of human mosaics um, reduces to some degree uh, the distinction between laws and things like initial conditions, because initial conditions do the same thing. And, and you know, in a dynamically productive view on laws, laws really are like different fundamentally from things like initial conditions, whereas in a constraint framework, it's more a question of degree. Yeah. I think now, now you have to say, well, what makes it a law is that, well, initial conditions can be arbitrarily complicated and we don't care. Yes. We don't care if we have very complicated initial conditions, whereas we, we do have these you know, epistemic criteria for, you know, for laws and we couldn't find them if they weren't, couldn't find laws if they weren't simple enough. And maybe we want to require it in, in some sense they're simple. Do you see any, so is what I'm saying like consistent with how, how you see things or do you think there are still some uh, a, a important additional distinctions between laws and things like initial conditions? And I know, you know, in, in some of Eddie's recent work, right, uh, Eddie, I hope, I hope I'm characterizing this okay, but, but, you know, initial conditions like on the initial density matrix of the universe that could be viewed as something like, like a law. So Emily, do, do you see those as as now questions of degree, uh, or, or do you see there's being something a little more fu fundamental there still? Yeah, so I think I think this framework leaves space for something like initial conditions. And we saw that in the discussion of determinism where you can sort of end up with some set of mosaics in your intersection and you have to select one somehow. And so that arbitrary choice of one mosaic out of the allowed mosaics plays the same kind of role as initial conditions, except that it's no longer like expected to be localized at the start of time for, for no particular reason. Um, that said, uh, I, I very much agree with Eddie that there are circumstances in which you know, initial conditions could be sufficiently simple, but that they would look like laws or laws or constraints in this framework. So I think there's, there's a good case to be made that something like the past hypothesis um, or the initial density matrix should be regarded as a constraint in this kind of framework and so if there is any arbitrariness remaining after that it wouldn't be in the initial conditions it would be in some other kind of some other way um 
you know, I, 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 I'm very interested in the possibility of strongly deterministic laws where there's really no arbitrariness at all and you just get one, one single human mosaic and that would be that would be kind of the dream, I guess. Um, so, uh, but the framework does also allow for sort of the arbitrariness and selection and don't have strongly deterministic laws. Great, thanks. Um, I have one additional question. I see there's no other hands. Um, so, uh, when you brought up nomic frequentism, you know, Roberts's paper on this, um, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I'm wondering how how far you think we're allowed to go um, with uh, laws of that nature. So um, would it be in, in your view okay to, to, to posit uh, a constraint type law that specifies not merely, you know, proportions of, of results, but something a little more fine grained, like uh, that the distribution of results needs to be, um, you know, uh, random in, in, in like, you know, different definitions, but one random or Martin Luff random or, or something like that. Like, is that, would that be considered simple enough to be a candidate for a, a lot like, suppose I wanted to say, for example, that, um, I'm going to regard the Born rule as a nomic frequentist type law, but I'm, I'm not just going to say that it describes proportions of outcomes. I'm going to say that it, it really describes, it, it, what it's really saying is that, you know, outcomes of quantum mechanical experiments are, are random in that more formal sense, but with a bias given by, by the Born rule. Would that be acceptable as a candidate constraint law in your view? Yeah, I definitely see no reason why that couldn't be a constraint law. And um, I think there's a temptation to say that to say that maybe that kind of law is unnecessary because if you are arbitrarily selecting from a set of mosaics which all obey the born rule, in some sense you're more likely to get one in which they're randomly distri distributed. But some care is required here because the idea of arbitrary selection right was and typicality and so probability. Exactly um, right. I'm trying so, to be non-circular here. That's the idea. yeah exactly. So there's a there's a temptation to say well well you'll just automatically get one which obeys those kind of conditions. But you know perhaps one should be more careful and should build that in as an explicit law in advance. Great. I see Eddie has a hand. I don't know if it's related, but Eddie, please go ahead. I think you have the last question, Eddie. I think we're we're just about out of time, and I want to end uh, at three. It was exactly the point you just mentioned, Jacob, about randomness and point that Emily mentioned that can be a constraint law as well. That so my reservation only frequentism as the one that formulated in uh, Robert's two papers of your sci archive is exactly that uh, it's not designed to handle randomness properties. So proportionally by itself is insufficient for our understanding probabilist laws, even if maybe core square in some, some way. But uh, thinking of say a sequence one zero one zero one zero one zero as a Sequence for fail coin, that's just not going that, to happen. That's exactly what I had in mind. I wanted to write. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we have to build in this randomness in a non circular way, like you said, into the constraint properties of the laws. And how to do it, I think, is a challenge. And also, another challenge is how to do it in a simple way. So I kind of insist on simplicity, not as definitional lawhood, but as still a criterion for guide for lawhood. So we should try to strive for a simple definition for randomness. And in a non circular way, well, so have a non circular simple definition for randomness in addition to the proportion idea. I think um, so. I, the best bet I maybe was typicality. If yeah, there's a way to understand typicality um, as a reduction for probabilistic laws and understand typicality in terms of constraints, um, that might be the way to go that can cover both deterministic typicality and interministic typicality or W. Yeah, I agree. It would be nice if there was some typicality account which would kind of come out with the consequence that that you can naturally expect to see a sort of IID distribution of events across your random your series of random events. Um, right, except the IID that. condition. <laughs> yeah. The IID condition will have to be cash out in terms of typicality itself. Exactly. That is yes. the in IID into the definition of the measure or uh, definition of the sequence of large, large, large numbers. Yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, I don't I don't know exactly how to do that right now, but I'd certainly like to see, see that done. Yeah, I, I have a kind of rough idea, but <laughs> it'll have to wait for another time because we're out of time and I want to make sure we end right. on time. I want to thank Emily again for a fantastic talk and a great discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. This was great. And thanks to everybody who could make it. Um, thank you so we're, yeah, thanks again. So we're, we're out of time. Um, we'll be meeting again in two weeks on September Tuesday, September 20th. Uh, uh, Gabriel Carcassi is going to be giving that next talk. He's actually here, um, and, and he'll be here again in, in, in two weeks. Um, thanks again, everybody, for your time. I know how valuable it is, and I hope to see you uh, in two weeks. Take care. Thank be you safe. so much.